It's perhaps not controversial to say we all crave some form of certainty in our lives. To be uncertain about things can be profoundly uncomfortable and painful. We want to know when our employer is going to pay us. We want to be sure that our vehicle will start when we turn the ignition, especially if we're running late. We want to know that a plane we boarded five minutes ago will not suddenly plummet from 30,000 feet up. And I submit most of us want to know if there's really a creator of the cosmos. The craving for certainty is all around us, and perhaps we don't even realize it most of the time. But certainty can and often does have a dark side. There are holy books and religious traditions that have been certain about the morality of genocide, slavery, and rape throughout history. Historically, religious traditions have proclaimed that these actions were morally and ethically good. But to keep up with an ever-changing world, some of these religious traditions have had to abandon their old certainties for more liberal ones. It turns out that these religious traditions were, in fact, not certain about their views. The reason so many have believed these so-called certainties in the past is perhaps because they were taught them from a very early age. This is where one's culture and society perhaps plays a significant role. Joseph Goebbels, the chief propagandist for the Nazi party during World War II, once said that if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. Part of Goebbels' job was to convince the German people that the Nazi party was their future and political savior. In other words, Goebbels tried to convince the German people that the Nazi party was a cosmic certainty for the ages to come. This obviously didn't turn out the way Goebbels wanted. Another prominent example of a widely held belief being mistaken for certainty is Galileo's research and ultimate acceptance in the 1630s that the planets revolved around the sun. Before Galileo, the Catholic Church dogmatically held that the planets and sun rotated around the earth, otherwise known as geocentrism. However, Galileo discovered geocentrism to be incorrect, but the Catholic Church wanted certainty more than anything, and so it only made sense to reject Galileo's discoveries. Consequently, Galileo was charged with heresy and placed under house arrest for the remainder of his life. Again, we crave certainty. Romanian philosopher Emil Turin wrote that, quote, History is nothing but a procession of false absolutes." Close quote. One way of explaining Turin's thought here is that the entire history of humanity is a landscape of wrong conclusions that have only been improved upon by more sophisticated wrong conclusions. And this series of wrong conclusions will continue so long as humanity is on a journey of discovery. The scientific community, for example, holds that evolution and the Big Bang are accurate models for describing the development of life and the beginning of the cosmos, respectively. However, Chirin might suggest that both of these theories will eventually be proven wrong by the revelation of new information in the future, and so on ad infinitum. In this way, Chirin might submit that humans don't have access to true knowledge or objective reality, and we never will. Chirin appeared to push back against some kinds of knowledge, as they seem to point toward a dogma he simply didn't accept. In his essay entitled Genealogy of Fanaticism, Chirin wrote, quote, What is the fall of man, he's referring to the Garden of Eden here, What is the fall of man but the pursuit of a truth and the assurance you have found it, the passion for a dogma, domicile within a dogma? Again, he writes, Even when he turns from religion, man remains subject to it. Depleting himself to create false gods, he then feverishly adopts them. His need for fiction, for mythology, triumphs over evidence and absurdity alike. His power to adore is responsible for all his crimes. A man who loved a god unduly forces other men to love his god, eager to exterminate them if they refuse." Close quote. Chirin's language here appears to suggest he's specifically targeting the religious, but he's drawing attention to all dogmas in the world. The unbridled faith in logic, reason, and mathematics of the secularists also fall under Chirin's critical eye here all of which are accepted as true without justification. Chirin isn't alone in his criticism. Before him, there were the Peronian skeptics of ancient Greece, who proposed that true knowledge of anything was uncertain and therefore it was best to suspend judgment. Anisodemus, a Greek skeptic, wrote that Peronists affirm the appearance without affirming that it is of such a kind. We too perceive that fire burns, but we suspend judgment about whether it is its nature to burn. Close quote. In other words, there may be a fundamental difference between a thing's appearance and the reality of the thing itself. Sextus Empiricus, a 2nd century Peronic skeptic, wrote Outlines of Peronism, where he draws out the skeptical position while launching a critical attack against what he perceived as the dogmatists of his day. 
such as the Stoics and the Epicureans and the Platonists. Sextus wrote, quote, Skepticism relieved two terrible diseases that afflicted mankind, anxiety and dogmatism. Despite the skeptics' laborious efforts, the vast majority of humans today still subscribe to some sort of dogma without suspending judgment. And maybe there's a good reason for this. There's an idea within the field of psychology known as terror management theory, also known as TMT, which suggests humans subscribe to dogmas and worldviews that tend to protect their self-esteem, perceived worthiness, and sustainability. Terror management theory suggests we do this as a way to evade the inevitability of death. Psychology Today published a piece about terror management theory which stated, quote, TMT proposes that individuals are motivated to develop close relationships within their own cultural group in order to convince themselves that they will somehow live on, if only symbolically, after their inevitable death, close quote. Those who find terror management theory a viable explanation for our attempts to stave off death consider it an evolutionary trait. The same Psychology Today piece mentioned that, quote, humans naturally became aware of dangerous threats as a means of preserving their lives and continuing their gene pool. The deep existential anxiety that comes with that knowledge is an unfortunate byproduct of this evolutionary advantage. However, TMT presents us with a paradox. If the propensity for subscribing to prejudices and dogmas is a way to give our lives symbolic meaning, worthiness, and sustainability, all as a way to survive our physical lives, it seems feasible that this very evolutionary mechanism could annihilate our species in the future. Imagine for a moment there's a political figure who wishes to secure his or her place in the history books by carrying out an unprecedented political action, say, a nuclear holocaust. According to TMT, this political figure could be evolutionarily motivated to carry out said nuclear holocaust as a way to live on symbolically after they die even though there would be no survivors to consider said political action after the dust settles. If TMT is tenable, it'd have to concede that the evolutionary process has a built-in self-destruct button. Every species wants to continue living. And while TMT is perhaps a useful framework with which to think about human mortality, it might be best for us, like the Peronian skeptics, to suspend judgment until we have more durable information. Of course, it's perhaps the case we will never have enough information to make any lasting sense of the strangeness of the cosmos. Perhaps Chirin is correct. Perhaps we are on an infinite trajectory of abandoning wrong conclusions for just other wrong conclusions.